Studios. This is Caribbean Power Lunch with your host, Kevin Valley. In this episode, we want to talk about business continuity, succession planning, and exit planning. Here we're going to talk to Rochelle Clark. Hailing from Guyana, Rochelle Clark is a business consultant that keeps businesses in business with business continuity planning, transition preparation. Now, through her company, she ensures that retiring leaders, the incoming successors, and the businesses that support them are ready to move successfully to the next stage of their business, their life cycle, whether it be by succession or sale of their business. Now, hailing from Guyana, Rochelle Clark is a published author. She, she authored the book, The Five Critical Succession Conversations. She's been featured on Forbes, New York Times, CEO Magazine, and that's just the name of you. She's a Wharton graduate with an MBA in strategic planning, currently living in one of my favorite cities of Amsterdam. And she says that 85% of failed business transitions occur because of poor communication. So without further ado, let's get it on to Rochelle. Rochelle Clark. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, Kevin. All right, Rochelle. So, you know, it's, you, it's stated that 85% of failed business transitions, where you try to take your business from one generation to the next, occur, occur, occur <laughs> <laughs> because of poor communication, mistrust, and a lack of planning. So I know you have this, you have this Genesis story that you're probably a little tired of, of telling. And we, we spoke about it a little bit before. It's like, okay, all right, I'm going to have to tell the story. But you know, I, yes, it's important. You know, you would have spent 15 years in, well, not only corporate America, just global, corporate global, you know, working with, com with com companies like Accenture, Heineken on global strategy and whatnot. But then you had to rescue your own family business using some of those principles. Can you just walk us through that, what that looked like? Absolutely, Kevin. And I actually don't mind telling the story because, you know, there's the fact that there are many people who are listening for the first time. And I think that this may be enlightening to them. I trust that it is. So um, a, a number of years ago, I found myself flying home from a family funeral, frantically putting in place a business continuity plan for the business. What happened was that the owner passed away suddenly, as, as these deaths typically happen, his daughter was preparing to take over the business, but she wasn't ready yet to take it over um, when, he, when he passed. So we were in a really tricky situation of planning for a funeral at the same time that we were planning and figuring out what to do with this business, how to keep this business in operation because so many people relied on it. So that is actually where I came into the picture and I was able to put a lot of the business continuity um, aspects and, and, and capabilities that I would have learned in the corporate world, I was able to very quickly apply that to my own family situation. Obviously, in the corporate world, you're talking big multinational corporations, but it was how do we boil that down to something that's really relevant for a smaller business? So this is where it started. And, um, you know, I was still doing my job, enjoying it in, in, in corporate life. And I was saying, you know what? businesses, smaller businesses, family-owned businesses are so vulnerable, but someone should be out there helping them. Yeah. And it was one of those moments where you said, yeah, I'm sure somebody else is taking care of it. Someone else is taking care of them. They don't need me to, to step into the ring. But the idea really stuck with me and stayed with me um, until I eventually ended up starting my own firm, focusing on two things. First of all, it's business transitions. So helping retiring owners, their incoming successors, and the organizations that rely on them mm -hmm. to transfer the business from one generation of leadership to the next, right. right? Successfully and smoothly. And this is where communication comes in, but I have a feeling that we're going to talk about that later. Um, and the second component is I said, you know what, There's, I'm never going to set up a business, particularly working with smaller businesses that does not have a focus on business continuity planning because that truly is focusing on ensuring that the business can continue in the event of something unplanned happening, an unplanned disruption. And um, there are, they tend to call these the five Ds, right? Um, right. I was trying to find the five Ds, you know, when I was, <laughs> I was like, what's the death? And, anyway, go ahead. <laughs> the five Ds. Um, the five Ds are the five major disruptions that one in every two businesses will face during its lifetime. 
There are five major disruptions that one in every two businesses will face during the business's life cycle. One in every two, that, that's 50%. One in every two, 50%, oh. right? Those Ds or those disruptions are death, unexpected death. I think that's mm -hmm. a no-brainer. Disability, divorce, mm -hmm. disagreements. Well, that's a big one and distress. And some of the listeners might be saying, okay, well, now we're going through this COVID-19 pandemic. Where does that fall? That falls under a distress situation because you have lots of businesses that are in distress based on the regulations that have come in that have shut them down. So one in every five will, one in every two will face one of those five. And I think based on the events of this pandemic, many have already hit that mark, right? right? From a distress okay. situation. No, that's, no, that's super interesting because you mentioned death disability, divorce, disagreements, and distress, right? And you say distress is something like COVID, that's you know, yes. a pandemic that's outside of your control. And we yes. speak about death, disability, divorce. No, well, maybe, let's leave. All right, so maybe death and disability. Those are both things that, I mean, yeah, you could control, you could prolong, you know, health and all of that, but that's, although that's something that's close, is closer to the inevitable side. Divorce, well, well, that, I mean, there's worse than disagreement, I suppose. That's, those are two things you, you can't control, right? Because that's all about your relationship, all about your, 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 um, your communication and stuff. I mean, I really wanted to understand. So, yes, you spent all this time working with, working with um, large corporates like Accenture, where you're consulting a bunch of um, large companies and so on. You're a strat your global strategy manager for Heineken. So what common... I want to say mistakes or common issues or common challenges you see in those businesses with a family business like the one you had to, you had to save at the start of your business. Well, and I think it comes down to, to, the, to the major premises that I founded my own business on. First of all, continuity. It's planning for the unplanned. Because here is the thing, Kevin. Many companies and many business owners know what goes into building their business, right? It takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. Right. Um, when one of these disruptions hits, that is essentially taking money that would have otherwise gone into the growth and development of the business. You're taking that allocation of money away from the growth of the business and you're then applying it to respond to whatever it is that you're facing. Right. So many corporations, major corporations, ensure that they minimize the number of disruptions on the core business. Because by minimizing the disruptions on the core business, they're then able to allocate that energy, allocate the resources into growing the business. Right. Right. So it's a change in mindset where, yes, there's the focus on growth, but the, 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 I would say the secret, the other secret that many smaller businesses don't hear about is the fact that it's not only about growing the business, but it's protecting that growth. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's key. So, so that, that is one of the first things. And the, and the other thing that I would like to talk about, the other focus you said, um, as I compared corporate life to a smaller business, is their focus on the future, the long-term thinking. And some businesses, some firms do this better than others. And this, in planning for the future, you're talking about your succession and your long-term planning. Right. right. So what is the plan for the business in many corporations? They already know that they have a long term trajectory. Right. They have long term goals that they're trying to achieve. And as a result of that, they're planning under ways of operation, ensure that they're able to meet those goals. And they do that by ensuring that they have the right people in place, not only immediately, but for the foreseeable future. And this is where a lot of smaller businesses now, granted, they're facing different um, challenges as they grow because many small business owners are focused on the day to day. But if it is that they do have long term, a long term goal in mind for this business, it would help them to give some thought to how they'll achieve that long term potential, the long term growth of the business. It's yes, protecting the growth, but also recognizing that the humanity in all of the people who work there and saying, okay, for the future, what are my succession plans going to be? What, what is my plan for this business and how do I get there? Yeah. Just um, last year, I was on a, I was on a panel for um, sports industry, Trinidad and Tobago. Um, they had this business conference and they asked me to be on a panel and the title of the panel was something like 
entrepreneurship versus business owner or entrepreneur versus business owner? What are the, you know, the key differences between an entrepreneur <laughs> and a business owner? And I found it so interesting just now when you were saying that, you know, there's that short-term thinking versus that long-term thinking, you know, business owner, essentially investor, right? You're investors. And when you're uh, any sophisticated investor with a salt is thinking or, or her salt um, is thinking long-term. Yeah. Right, so they're looking for a company that could um, generate returns in the long term, and I kind of likened an entrepreneur to somebody just you know. Well, I mean, nothing's wrong with being an entrepreneur, of course. You know, I'm I'm an entrepreneur right now. That's where it all starts. That's where <laughs> every single business starts, Kevin. That is the seed for every single business, every single corporation that you see out there. It started with one. Right. Yeah, I mean, entrepreneurs, are, you know, they, they have ideas, they're trying to solve problems, and, they, you know, they're, they're trying to make it work, and they're trying to get from, trying to get from one period to the next, just trying to keep, trying to keep running, trying to keep going. Um, business owners, you know, they have the time to put, you know, all these systems in place to make sure that the businesses are wrong in, a long term, in the long term and protect their investment. So I'm thinking it might be, so, and you could correct me, it's just like a different stage in the life cycle of entrepreneurship. So maybe you graduate from an entrepreneur to a structured business owner. You know, so how do you help me? And if yeah, you look into your industry, uh, Rosha, uh, like absolutely. how would you how would you contrast an entrepreneur versus a family business owner? So, and you know, this is what I say. A, I'll start off by saying I'm not going to paint everyone with the same brush. Right. You have to recognize that there are different levels of organization that everyone brings to the table for their own um, operation, which is fine. But to answer your question, the difference, the distinct difference between um, a, an entrepreneur and a family business owner is just the, the scale and the scope of operation. Every single business started out with an entrepreneur. Every single business started out with one, mm -hmm. right? Yes. The difference is that that one person in a family business context has graduated, right? So the business has grown. The number of people around them have, have potentially increased and they're, next, and they're thinking about the next generation of leadership within the business. In many cases, that person will be a member of the family if, if, if it is that they're going for this family business, con following the family business concept. But then we get into distinctions. An owner of a business doesn't necessarily need to be a manager working in the business. Now, an entrepreneur wears many hats, right? I'll give the three primary hats that an, that an, that an entrepreneur wears, um, particularly if they're working in and among family. One, they're the business owner, right? So they're an owner of the business, right? They're also a manager within the business because they're working in the business actively. And then they're managing the family aspect of things, mm -hmm. right? So three hats, at least three primary hats. Of course, they, they basically are every, every, everything and everyone when it comes to the business, but those are the three primary areas of focus. They're focusing on owner, owning the business, working in the business, and then managing the family dynamic all within this one person. Yes. As the business grows, it becomes almost impossible for all of those responsibilities to fall within one person, right? And as a result of that, what you find is that from generation to generation, perhaps you have more family members coming on board. Many of them are coming on board with ownership stakes in the business, but maybe they're not qualified. They may not have the capabilities to work in the business. Mm -hmm. Right. So in that case, they take that step back. And while they are owners of the business, they are not operators in the business. Right. So this is where the hats start getting separated. And then you have some family members who may never work in the business or have an ownership stake. But this is not the moment to necessarily put them to the sideline and think that they have no, um, no use, because in many cases, they are the shadow advisors. What that means is that they have the ear of whomever is working in the business or whomever owns the business. So think about it in this way. You have, I don't know, two brothers who are working in the business. They're, they've married um, two lovely ladies um, and you know, their wives are working outside of the business. It would be an oversight to believe that the wives are completely blind and have absolutely no impact on what happens in the business. 
right? Because when the husbands come home from work and, you know, I'm following the, the stereotypical mindset that we have with the family and, and, and working and everything. When the family gets together, the husband is speaking about work, the wife has an opinion, right? She may have an opinion, right? And the husband takes that opinion on, takes it back to the workplace, and then perhaps that gets enacted. So those shadow advisors, in many cases, if it's a huge family and you're talking- I love talking, that term. <laughs> I love that right? term, shadow advisors. I'm well, they, know. right, they are, they are, they right? So shadow advisors. <laughs> it, it would be, it would be, Unver highly unfortunate for you to put non-involved family members to the side and think that they have no impact on the business. If it's a bigger family, as the family gets bigger, generations and generations down the line, and you have cousins and cousins get married and da 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 da, da it, it's expanded. What you end up needing is family governance. Right. And this is a way for managing the, the, the needs, the desires, the wants, the inputs of family members in a way that it doesn't play out on the stage of the business. Right. So as the business expands, as you um, as it graduates from one generation to the next, it's about putting the right governance in place so that everyone's needs are addressed in the right forum. Right. So those three hats that I spoke with um, from a from an entrepreneur standpoint, you're owning the business, you're working in the business and you're managing family. And it's the one person doing all of that. As the business graduates, as it grows, you find that those hats get separated. So you may have one set of owners. Right. Who have shares in the business mm -hmm. who are not involved in the actual management of the business. The actual managers of the business may actually not be family members anymore. Right. You may have outside managers, right. right? And then you have a forum for dealing with the needs of the family. So as this business grows, as it matures, you have a different way of handling and dealing with everything that, that will be coming down the pipe because it would be nearly impossible for one person to handle it all. You know, this is, this is super, super, super interesting. Okay, so I mean, you just, what you just described was essentially like the evolution of uh, a typical family business. So I've seen, I've seen and worked in family business where it's, you know, it's, it's in the third generation, okay. you know, large, large family business. And I've also worked family business where it's essentially in the first generation. Right. And um, I've seen the, the, the differences involved in there. And I think just, I'm um, thinking about the audience. I think our audience will most likely be in that, in that space of family businesses in the first generation. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so a lot of, and I, and I want to extend that definition of family to, to close friends. Cause a lot of time, a lot of times <laughs> when we start businesses, we look for people we know, like, and trust yes. to, to work with us. And many times those people end up being people within our circle, be it family, family and friends. But, mm -hmm. you know, and we could, spend, we could spend this whole podcast just talking about family businesses and the <laughs> dynamics of working family, in family businesses. But this, um, in terms of developing that framework, um, for, for listeners. All right. So as we know, like working in family businesses, they, they have, it's, there's the intricate differences, um, from working in a regular business and, and um, the differences in ex expectations, what is expected from you, how, you know, just kind of clarifying reporting lines and everything. And you, you know, you mentioned family governance. So I guess my first question, cause there's so many, yeah. <laughs> All right. How, like, how do you manage that dynamic in terms of, you know, you're working in a family business, like, so okay, so your older, your older sibling might be, might be, um, might be your boss or, or, or what have you, <laughs> but then, you know, but then on the weekend, you know, you have been, you have been family dinner or, or you know, family birthday lime or, 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 you know, what have you. So how do you manage those dynamics and you kind of separate church and state and try to, you know, and how do you compartmentalize that? Right. So honestly, Kevin, it comes down to governance. And I don't want to throw a, a big sounding um, intimidating word like governance um, <laughs> into the mix. Right. Because I know that that word in, by its own nature can turn a lot of people off. But listen, ultimately, you need everyone needs to be in their own lane. Right. You have to think about it from the standpoint of responsibility and accountability. Mm -hmm. Everyone needs to have a role that they're playing. 
right? Everyone's role needs to be documented as much as possible. Yes. Right. This is what you're responsible for. This is what I'm responsible for. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't have people running into each other's lanes because then one of the, one of the issues that you find is around boundaries. Yes in a business, right? Yes. Because there's fat, because you're working with friends and family, a lot of times that professional relationship, right, gets muddied along the way with the personal relationship, which is which is great when things are going well. When things are not going well, it's not so good. Right? So to start off, to save a lot of heartache, it mm -hmm. starts by having clear responsibilities. Yes, John, you're coming in. This is what you're responsible for. Now, it may take a little while. I'm not saying it's, it's as easy as coming in, here's your, here are your responsibilities and we won't have any issues to deal with ever. You have to also recognize the, um, the mindset in something like this, right? People come in with preconceived notions as to how their family members are. So, for example, if you have a, a, a family business, the, the aunt, for example, is the, is the accountant, the chief accountant. Her nephew joins the business. Let's call him Johnny. For the life of Auntie Margaret, right? Let's call her Margaret. For the life of Auntie Margaret, she cannot see Johnny outside of this image that she has of him as this two-year-old running around with a lollipop. Right. Right? So she cannot reconcile the fact that Johnny is now head of marketing for the business and he has good, sound, solid ideas that can move this business forward. Right. So at times it can be a mindset thing that needs to be over an identity thing, I should say, that needs to be overcome. And that honestly is overcome. Uh, it, it takes a lot of shrugging sometimes, but in delivery. Mm -hmm. Right. It's coming in, having those clear responsibilities. And as Johnny is delivering, as the results are coming, Auntie Margaret's view of Johnny starts to change because she's able to see what he can deliver. Mm hmm. Right. So, so that is one thing that I want to touch about, touch on, and that's ensuring that you have clear responsibilities. The second thing, and this is the tricky part when you're dealing with friends and family is accountability. What happens when they're not following through on the responsibilities right. that have been laid out? Right. And this is where, this is, this is where the tough love needs to come in. Right. It needs to be very clear from the beginning. Yes, I know it's a, it's, a, it's a business that's now starting out and you're just probably so grateful for the help and you're grateful for a warm body that you can trust to help move it forward. But recognize the disservice that you're doing to the business by bringing someone in who is not able to deliver at the level that you need them to deliver at. And I know many times coming into a family business, the expectations on a family member are above and beyond what is expected of other employees. Other employees clocking at, clock in at nine, clock out, clock out at five, family members are expected to be there 24 hours a day. Eh, no, this is where the boundary also comes in, right? It's okay, coming into this business, th these are the expectations. I recognize that sometimes we need to pull our sleeves up, uh, you know, roll our sleeves up and get things done, but don't take advantage of your loved ones for the sake of the business. Okay. Because... The business may not be there in the long term, but your family members and your friends will be. All right. right. Okay. So, it's, all right. So, you spoke about the governance, you know, the um, accountability as well as the responsibility. And I just want to be you know, like, super clear in terms of the takeaway here. So, you're yeah. saying the, the important thing to do is to document what are, what are the, um, what are your roles? What are your, what are your responsibilities? What are your reporting lines? To make and to make sure to guard against that, so you always have it in black and white, not yeah. not oh. just understood. Not in your head, mm -hmm. not not to be kind of halfway had a conversation with with someone over a drink, where someone said, "Yeah, man, you know what I mean," and the other person said, "Yeah, man, I know what you mean." Uh, no, 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 no. Sit down, have some dedicated time to sit down, speak about the responsibilities coming in. Speak about the flip side of the responsibilities coin, because the flip side of responsibility is accountability. Yes. All right. You sit down and, and you have that conversation. All right. Coming into the business, this is where I'll need your help with primarily. All right. Let's document that. This is what the accountability is going to look like. You know, in some cases it's all right. You know what? I'm going to need, you know, three strikes and you're out. And it goes both ways, perhaps. Right. This is what I expect from you. I'm going to need feedback from you every six months or so. Because then the other, um, the other um, 
hindrance of working in a family business, particularly for members of the younger generation, the next gen, is that they come in and they say, well, are these really transferable and marketable skills that I'm learning? Well, they are. If your role is crafted in such a way that you have sound responsibilities and you have someone weighing in and giving you that feedback on a regular basis, it absolutely can be. But many miss that step at the beginning. So what I would say, Kevin, when it comes to the, the, the governance, it's having those um, roles and responsibilities. It's about having the right policies and procedures, of course, but have that sit down with the members so that they understand what their responsibilities are and what accountability will look like. Okay. And then be firm. <laughs> you have to be firm. Okay. In the enforcement, you have to be firm, right? right. Otherwise, okay. you know, what, what's the use? <laughs> So what I would say is that for small and medium-sized businesses now starting out, if you're now starting out and you just have one or two family members, you can do this on your own. You don't need to be hiring outside help or advisors to, to get you know, the, the, the responsibilities and the accountability done. You can handle this on your own. However, if it gets to the point where you have multiple family members and you're trying to figure out who does what, mm -hmm. sometimes it's better to have an outside um, advisor, particularly a family business advisor who's able to pick up on that underlying dynamic, right. right? That comes through when you're working with close friends and family, because they're then able to say, okay, this is what the, um, the, the ways of working will look like. Um, this, do we agree on the vision? Do we agree on the values that, that, we're, that we're embodying here in this organization? And how is it that we will hold ourselves and the business to those values, to that vision, and to the responsibilities that we have. So it takes it to another level. And when you get to that level, the need for professionalizing the business gets greater, right? And that's where the, the need for an external advisor would come in. But I, wouldn't, I would say no if you're now starting out it's, and it's something that you can handle. One or two or three family members, you should be able to handle it on your own. Now, many people are conflict avoidant. And in that case, you may prefer to have an outsider step into guide. But um, if, if, if it's something that you're fine working with and dealing with, you can do it on your own. All right. So we, we, covered, we covered family business governance there. But um, you, you touched on another thing a few times that's really, really important. That's I'm not, I'm not as sure that can be handled by documenting. And that's boundaries, right? <laughs> No, no, it's, yeah, and boundaries is a serious thing, right? So you could, be, you could be working in a family business. You could be working with your, your friends. And you could be getting a call from your family or friend on a Friday evening or a Saturday, Saturday morning and thinking, okay, is this call because they want to go to the beach or is this call because they want to discuss a project, right? How do you, how do you, manage, those, how do you manage those boundaries and not feel like your life is work, like work is life? You know, it's just me. So I work, I work, I work with family and I also have, have a business with, with friends. And just the other day, somebody asked me, so Kevin, what do you, what do you do? What do you do for, for fun? Like, what do you actually do for fun? Like when you're not working, I say, well, and I was like, well, well what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> work is fun. What do you, what do you mean? <laughs> work is life. Right. So how do you, how do you establish those boundaries and you, so you don't end up becoming a Kevin? <laughs> so you don't end up becoming a Kevin. I love that one. Listen, it comes down to communication. Um, I wrote a book a couple of years ago called um, The Five Critical Succession Conversations, a book prim primarily for families and business. It really comes down to communication and the expectations that you set. And this is not only working with, with family members or friends, it's also in your personal relationships. Mm-hmm setting the right boundaries, right? What is it? What? So I think it, it, it comes down to you interrogating what it means for you to be in this business, right? How, what sort, and what, not only what would it mean for you as an individual, but what would it mean for your friendship? How would you like to see your friendship or, or your family relationship evolve as a result of, of, of this? And give some really good thought to how you would be comfortable handling, how you might be comfortable handling any conflict that comes up. Now, recognize also that communication is a two-way street. So in many instances, you may have this fantastic, perfect plan about how you're going to deal and handle with anything that comes your way, but unless and until you're communicating that with others, 
right? It can potentially not be as useful. So for example, the instance where you have a friend, a, 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 um, a message coming in on Friday evening, at first, before you joined the business, you would have been happy because you're like, okay, my friends want to line. We're going to have some downtime. This is going to be great. But now you're dreading and you're looking at the phone with, with a side eye because you're thinking, well, is this fun or is this work? Right now that demonstrates a lack of boundaries. Yeah. Right. Because in a situation where there are boundaries, perhaps you have, um, you know, everyone's communicating via WhatsApp these days. Right. So the expectation might be something that when, a way that you might deal with this is by saying, okay, yes, we're going to communicate by WhatsApp, but all business conversations will happen in this chat. Any conversation outside of business will happen someplace else. So it's not, you're talking, you're not talking about the, 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 the party that you went to last weekend in the business chat, not the place for it. Right. And I have this with my own family, you know, working in business versus um, personal. And we have two separate chats, right? So when we're talking business, it happens in one, one um, chat, let's say. When we're talking family stuff, if it's mom sending across the funny memes or all the forwards and everything, that happens someplace else. Mm -hmm. You know, one or two times, people might slip and forget. And then you say, okay, that's not the forum for this. And everyone in the, in the group feels comfortable saying that because they know ahead of time what you're trying to achieve. Right. And the person who may have sent the funny message just says, OK, sorry, sorry, yeah, man, wrong. You know, I made a mistake or something like that. But you protect. Right. This is a boundary. When we're talking business, we're talking business. And this is the forum for talking business. Anything outside of that is where the friendship steps in. Right. The same way that. So so this is one way. So this is dealing with chat. Another thing that you may have is. All right. Listen. When we go, when we go out um, to, 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 to dinner or something as friends, we're not talking business. But as I mentioned, <laughs> it exactly takes I was going. two. It's accountability, right? It takes two because one person can start, but the accountability comes when the other people are aware of this and they're able to shut it down. Now, if you let somebody break down your boundary and come in and then it ends up being one long work discussion, that's on you for not maintaining the boundary, right? You have to be accountable to yourself as well. So if you're out having a bear, right, with your friends and you're just chilling and you're chatting and, you're to and, and it's social time and the conversation starts to veer to business, right? That one person needs to catch themselves and say, okay, maybe this is not the forum for this, but the other person is equally as guilty for allowing it. But yeah. this starts if you have the expectations at the very onset. Okay. Right. No one has a crystal ball. So you can't all of a sudden roll up to the bar. One person starts talking business and the other person gets angry or responds in a way because that leaves the person who started the conversation by saying, wait, what now? I didn't know this was an issue. Right. So you have you set those expectations outside of the event. So you don't wait until you're at the bar to have a conversation about what we're going to talk at the bar. Right. At the beginning, you say, all right, you know, I want to maintain the friendship and in maintaining the friendship. This is how I think we should handle business and how we should handle personal. And then you take the responsibility as well in enforcing that. So yes. what if you're, what if you're, you're working with, you're working with someone, you know, with your family or your friends, whatever it is, and you're the one whose boundaries being encroached upon, but the, the, the encroacher, you know, to use, to use that term loosely, uh -huh. it might be somebody you reporting to and might be some might be somebody who you know might be a senior member of your of your family or somebody or somebody you know that that sort of that sort of outside power dynamic right mm -hmm. so would you say that that whole upfront um that whole upfront conversation would mitigate against that and then the so the, and then the 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 response to that the retort to that might be Hey, but I mean, I, I love what I do. I love my business. I, I, I love talking about my business anytime. You know, what, what's your problem? Why don't you want to talk about business on Saturday? Don't you, don't you love what you do? Are you serious? Are you a serious entrepreneur? <laughs> and in many cases, you might not be, right? And I'm not saying that you might not be. I, 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 let me take that back. You mm -hmm. may be, mm -hmm. but remember the dream sometimes lies in the entrepreneur, right? And that passion, right? That owner passion that that entrepreneur has 
may not be present in everyone else. Yes, they want to see the business succeed, but that level, that rel that level of relent that relentless pursuit of it may not lie in everyone else. So two things to answer your first question, I would say always have the conversation at the onset, know what you're getting into, right? Yes, it's a senior member of, of the family, right? You come in, but this is, this is a case where you kind of say, now granted, if it is that you're coming in in an internship position, right? And I know the conversation these days is, you know, the younger generation, they're so entitled and, and this and that and that and this. But, and yes, there are some positions where you need to pay your dues, but then at the same time, you have to recognize and understand what you are willing to give up in order to get there, right? It's not about being spoiled. It's about coming to that understanding. And I know it, it differs in, in many cultures. So in some cultures, they would not even dream of having a conversation like that. But you have to recognize what the long-term toll and impact might be. So try your best to communicate what you know, the, 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 the working dynamic might look like, right? I'm not saying that when crunch time comes, you're going to always hold to your boundaries. There are times that you're going to need to be flexible, not only working with family, but outside of the family dynamic. You may need to be flexible, but then it's about dialing back. You know, it's about saying, okay, let's kind of reset here. Yeah, you know, we, we seem to be out of the woods in terms of whatever we were dealing with. Um, but, you know, Uncle Joe or whomever, you know, I'm you know, maintaining the family. So family time is important. I'd like to spend some time with the wife and the kids. And this is our opportunity to do it um, just so that I can see it. And in many cases, many are understand. Many say that they're understanding, but they may need help when the enforcement time comes. So if you know that it's not a crunch time and it's not a request that is really critical at the moment, then this is the time where you can, where you can kind of suggest, okay, I recognize that it's the weekend. I'm happy to come back to you on, on Monday because, and you feel free to give a reason if, if this is something that you're comfortable doing. You know, I'm work, working with the family, we're out of town this weekend or, or whatever the deal might be. Right. I'm just thinking, okay, so can this be done retroactively? So if you're ready, if, if you're ready, um, <laughs> destroying all your boundaries and all, you, and, work is life, and all you do is work and all, and all your conversations about work, all your, all your drink slimes are about work, in all your family gatherings about work, all the all the time, anytime you hang out with your friends, there's some work involved there. How do you how do you retroactively fix this and establish boundaries? You say, okay, guys, let's just let's have this for fun, this for work. Like, how do you do that? Yeah, it's about having that conversation, right? Okay. Recognizing the toll. In many cases, because they value you as a person outside of the business, they recognize a that you have. Um, in many cases, they care about your well being as well. So this is, this is usually a good starting point for a conversation like this. So, you know, guys, you know, I love working with you guys and everything, but it's starting to take a toll on me. Um, so let's keep business to business and, and friendship to friendship and then suggest ways or brainstorm ways that may work for you all to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. But then, like I said, the, 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 um, the accountability needs to come in. So it's, if you have the conversation today and next week you meet for drinks and it turns into you know, a, a, a huge conversation about the next deliverable, then you kind of have, you have <laughs> let it slide, right? So it's about just kind of saying, all right guys, yeah man, I understand, but social setting. So let's, you know, if we need to schedule a meeting outside of work or someplace else to speak about business, no problem. Right. But or let's take this up on Monday or something like this. But in many cases, a it is possible. You but but it takes it takes a lot more effort. Right. Because you are going to you will slide back into your ways of working. Right. Whatever has been established before. So if you've been working with these friends for a long, long time and you recognize that end of week, you're going to just sit and you're going to talk about business and have a beer or something recognize that that dynamic, that habit, that pattern is going to be hard and difficult to break. So it may take a number of starts and restarts before you get there, but you have to keep consistent, right? In terms of keeping those boundaries, you have to keep consistent. And it helps if it's not only one person who's helping to enforce those boundaries, because everybody wants to fit in. Nobody wants to be the, the, the sore thumb who's ruining things by, you know, putting in this, this accountability, this new level of accountability, right? So if it's multiple people saying, all right, you know, I thought we said we weren't, we weren't going to talk to business. We weren't going to talk business. 
then ensure that multiple people are aware of what the agreement is and they can help you enforce it. Yeah. So, I mean, it, what I'm hearing overall is really, a, and it's part of that transition from being an entrepreneur to a business owner is structure. Yeah. You want to make sure you, you think, I mean, if there is one thing you want to keep in your mindset at all times is, okay, how do I implement more efficient structure in my business? You know, to, again, structure to make sure things are going in the long term. Anything I'm doing now, am I going to be comfortable doing this in the long term? If the answer is a no or maybe, then it's time to put some structure around that. Okay, and, and, but, been... and that's a good point that you make, Kevin, thinking long term, because you have to also recognize that as this business grows, you're going to have employees who will not be able to come to drinks on Friday. What happens then? Are they then out of the loop of any decisions that you make in that conversation? So thinking long term, set up the right um, forum to have the business conversations so that even as the business grows, your the integrity of your business conversations is going to be protected and everyone whether they're inside this intimate circle family or friend circle or outside of it mm -hmm. still feels as though that they're an active and contributing member of the business and as, you know and especially as you think about structure and long term you know we want to kind of get back into continuity right because okay. this is essentially to protect a business a business's operations in the event that something happens, right? And I know you have you have four guiding principles here. I just want to, just want to kind of go over quickly. Um, so then there's the people to contact if anything happens. There's the documents that need to be accessed. Again, if anything happens, make sure you have access to financing in place or insurances, of course. And then very importantly, you know, the operations. How do we protect the actual operations? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and I know you, and there's some, there are various inputs that we just want to kind of gloss over, you know, the, um, the relocation sites or service providers, suppliers, key clients, what equipment is essential and everything. And, and, and your company, Succession and Strength, you put together six to 11 page document that, that outlines that. So, you know, folks could learn more about continuity planning, but the important thing is to, make, to know that it's very important to keep in mind as you're operating and growing your business. Yeah, and, and, and the thing is to have everything related to the operations of this business documented in one place for mm -hmm. peace of mind, right? And of course, it's a good operating, it's a, it's a good strategy, operation strategy for your business. And this is in the event that anything happens, that you can pick up this business, all of the information is in one place and anyone can keep the business running, even if the primary entrepreneur or whomever is, is not able to at that time. And, um, you know, people would say, oh, well, you know, is this something that's for bigger companies? No, 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 no. Smaller companies rely on it as well. And what we say is, you know, from the moment that you have someone relying on the income of this business, put a business continuity plan in yes. place, right? So if it is that you're running this business and it just gives you, um, you know, fun money, right? If this is a hobby for you, a lifestyle, a lifestyle business, business. <laughs> right? Then yeah. you don't need a business continuity plan. Just, you know, when, when the business wraps, if anything happens, it goes with you and, and you're good to go. The moment, however, that you have people relying on the income of the business, and I'm talking your family members, I'm talking your employees, I'm talking your customers, et cetera. Well, not customers in this case, family members, employees, anyone close to you who's relying on the income of this business. Sometimes some may have creditors, and investors. investors. Yeah. yeah. Once people start relying on the income of this business, it is your duty, right? As a steward of this business, as an owner of this business, as a key operator of this business to ensure that you have a plan in place in the event that something happens, right? And it could be one of the five, but the important thing is everything is in one place so that in the event that something happens, anyone else whom you designate can pick it up and run with this business so that the income comes in, so that the income of the business and the operations can continue and the income comes in. So really it's about being able to respond confidently to any disruption so that the business's operations can come back on track and back online as quickly as possible. Right. And of course, the, the, five, the five Ds, death, yes, the five Ds. disability, divorce, disagreements, and distress. Yes. All right. So 
we we figured out our family dynamics. We got every, everything is in order. There's structure. There's boundaries. There's governance. We have our continuity plan in place, so the business is, is protected. Um, if God forbid a natural disaster happens, which we've, we've been seeing a lot in the um in the Caribbean recently. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about transition and succession, right? Yes. You know, so you want to be able to maximize that business value before transition. And you know, funny enough, many of the of the first generation business owners, if, 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 forget we're just family business owners, first generation business owners who've gotten to that place where they've established some level of traction, mm -hmm. where you know they have they have more than 10 employees or whatnot. So let's say they're the lower medium-sized business. Mm -hmm. You talk to them about what is, what is their number one concern or top three concerns. Succession is always in the top three. You know, what's going to happen when this business, when, when, when I need to step away, what happens when, when, I, when, when I need to take a vacation or what have you, right? So how do, how do we transition to the next generation? The next generation could be your son, your little brother. It could be um, a, a, a top employee in, with any business, but how do you, how do you plan for that? How do, you, how do you plan for that? Is it that from, from the person is hired, you say, all right, this looks like a golden, a golden, a golden, a golden. girl, this is a prodigy right here. Let's, let's groom them. Let's give them the, let's give them the gold gloves. And, and everything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how do you, yeah, how do you, how do you really smoothly plan, integrate succession into your business long before you need it, long before it becomes a problem? Listen, um, and Kevin, I'll take a step back and I'll answer that in two ways. First of all, by saying having your business be transition ready is also, I think, top of mind for many entrepreneurs and many owners because anything can happen. And I'm not only talking bad things, right? Ensuring that your business is transition ready is key because you never know what can happen. A, yes, of course, they're, they're one of the five Ds and perhaps you need to make an unplanned change in leadership. So you need to ensure that you have the right skills to back you up. But what if someone, what if, what if a purchaser, a buyer knocked on the door tomorrow, mm -hmm. right? And wanted to buy your business. Is your business transferable, right? Your business is absolutely not transferable if everyone relies on you as the owner or on certain key people for everything, Right. And that, of course, I think as, as, as a professional evaluator, I know that <laughs> when we're talking multiples, <laughs> right, that that is not, not a positive sign if the business is not transferable, ensuring that you have that bench strength, as it's called. Yes. Right. When you're thinking succession, it's about ensuring that the business can be transferable. Yes, to someone in the business, but perhaps to you know, even if the business were owned by some, someone else, giving that person the confidence in knowing that this business can still continue because we have this bench strength of groomed persons ready to take over. And you mentioned um, succession. It is a long-term strategy. Yes, of course, it helps with the transferability of a business, but there are two things to, two things to keep in mind because many people think succession, oh, that means dad's going to retire and he'll, he'll be replaced by my big brother. Right. There's a distinct difference here that I'd like to call out. There is, well, well, two things. First of all, succession, there's succession planning and succession preparation. We do succession preparation. Preparation because succession, and planning, two different things. <laughs> well, uh, yes, yeah, so and the distinction, <laughs> the distinction here is, listen, well, because people say, you know, well, just put a succession plan in place. Well, yeah, that's great. But you can go on Google, get a template for a succession plan, put it in place and you're good to go, mm -hmm. right? However, preparation is a much longer journey. And ultimately we say about five to seven years ahead of a business's leadership transition is when you ideally want to start that process of ensuring that you have the right successors in place because it's a preparation, it's a journey of preparation. Ensuring that the incoming successor is well prepared for the new role. Do they know what they're getting into? Have their skills gaps been analyzed, right? Have they been working towards filling those gaps? Are they a part of the culture of the organization? Can they take that on and run with it? And that takes time, right? So in succession preparation, you're talking about all of the tasks that are involved in preparing this next generation to take over. And it does not happen overnight, right? And I, I, I call out a second distinction because many people think, as I mentioned, dad's going to retire, Johnny will take over. That is not succession that you're talking about. You're talking about replacement planning, 
right? Essentially, you're saying, okay, what's the next warm butt that we can put in the seat so that, you know, there's someone at the helm. You're not necessarily doing Johnny a ser uh, Johnny or the business a service by having him or her come in un relatively unprepared for this new role. Yes, he may have been in and about the business growing up, but does he really know what it takes to run this business? Has he been, um, ha does he have the culture um, in, incorporated, you know, in, into his bones? Yes, perhaps if he's a family member, but does he also have the capability to run this business? Right. And this is where a program of preparation really comes in to ensure that Johnny is ready and, and able to take this business forward in a positive way. So two distinctions that I've made, the, the, the distinction between succession preparation and just putting a succession plan in place. Right. And secondly, replacement planning versus that whole succession preparation um, journey that businesses go through. OK, right. so we have the succession preparation which sounds like the active work. Yes. You know, the grooming, the, the culture fit, the, the coaching conversations, the ongoing training and what have you. Succession okay. plan sounds more like a, a document, essentially. Yes, like, essentially. Yeah. Essentially. Like right yeah. Okay. Yes, and you know, and to be quite honest, there are many professionals who can put a succession plan in place for you. Some lawyers might say, yeah, man, I can put a succession plan in place for you. What they do, they may, you know, no disrespect for them because it's a solid plan. But any plan of this nature needs to exude the, um, the DNA of the company, right? And that takes time, many cases, in terms of understanding the objectives of the outgoing leader, understanding the, the vision and the values of the organization to craft a plan that really is um, customized and speaks to that person's needs. Because can you imagine coming up to the point of succession Right. And someone says, yeah, man, we have a succession plan in place. Pull it up. OK, let's dust off the dust. OK, what is this saying now? Right. And in many cases, they don't recognize themselves in this plan that they are reading. It's completely foreign to them. And if they don't recognize themselves in it, the chances of them actually following through on what's in that plan goes down to zero, essentially. You know, right. So, yeah. Sorry, you know, but what it, I mean, guess what it, what it sounds like to me is like, is the difference between a consultant giving you a, a deliverable, a document and a coach working with you and, and, you know, keeping you accountable and saying, okay, this week you got to do that. Make sure you do that. Did you do that? How did that go? All right. What, well, what did you learn from that? And that, that sort of, that sort of guidance, but you own, you own the outcome as opposed to the consultant or yeah, or, or whoever owning that, that particular outcome. Exactly. Anyone can sit down and well, not anyone, but you know, because I don't want to minimize the, the work of, of other professionals, but even as a family business, and some may say, you know what, I can create a succession plan on my own. Yes, you can, right. You can go on Google, search for a template, fill it in if you need to, but the key to ensuring that it will be um, executed in the right way and, and resonate with your family and your, your own situation is by ensuring that your situation is reflected in that plan. And sometimes it takes an outsider to help you interrogate exactly what that looks like. Okay. Right? So where your, your company, Succession Strength, adds a lot of value is in that succession preparation. Yes, yes. So what we do is we work with the um, retiring or the outgoing leaders, their incoming successors and their organizations to prepare for this change in, in generation, generational leadership. Um, particularly, we do a lot of work with successors coming in, taking them through what is called a successor due diligence. Um, and, and this is where, you know, in many cases you have successors, primarily in many cases from family owned businesses who what do I call it? It's, it's, um, it's this false sense of security around their capabilities when it comes to running the business. Many of them believe, okay, because my name is on the building or because I've been in and out of these doors and I know intimately what, you know, from a distance, what goes on that, yeah, I'm capable of running it. But in many cases, when we do a due diligence, they recognize a number of things for themselves. Within a due diligence, we interrogate a, what, what, what the expectations of the role really are. So do you understand what it takes to run this business or, to, or what it takes to assume whatever role it is that you'll be stepping into, 
Are you comfortable with that? And does this fit your long-term objectives? Because you have many cases where you have successors who would much prefer to be doing something else than running the business. And this is key to understand from the very beginning, because when times get tough, as many times they do, right, you need that motivation to really see you through. And if you have someone coming in who is not on the same page, your business will not be in good hands necessarily when the tough times hit, right? So it's understanding where that person's head is at. And then we get into the actual running of the business. So, you know, do you even know what you will be in charge of? And in many cases, we call this the, um, the Lion King moment, right? Have you had your Simba moment? Um, hearkening back to the, the, the animated series, The Lion King, where the father, Mufasa, I think, takes Simba up on top of the rock, overseeing everything and says, you know, this is what you will be taking over from, from, her, from the horizon, you know, looking from the west to the east, all the way to the horizon. This is what you will be in charge of. Many successors coming into their roles have no idea they may be familiar with the core operations of the business, but they didn't know, for example, that the, the, that the business also has an arm that does real estate because they own a lot of properties. So it's really getting an understanding soup to nuts, end to end of what it is that you're taking over and then being able to understand, okay, this is where my capabilities lie. This is where I have gaps in my capabilities. Do we try to fill them as an individual? Or am I comfortable bringing someone else in with those capabilities to help supplement my own knowledge? So there's a lot of work that really goes into preparing a successor for the next role. My, my last question before, before we look to wrap, because you know we talk about preparing and grooming and successor due diligence and everything. So uh, my brother, is, well, my brother also runs a family business um, mm -hmm. you know, that he owns and whatnot. And his mantra to to employees is think like an owner that <laughs> it's, you know it's written on the walls you know it's 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 doctrine right so we always we always we always says hey think like an owner what would an owner do you know in terms of carrying out your duties in terms of how you think about the business how you, how you interact with clients how you you know that level of dedication that you give to clients and whatnot now my question you know and i and i think many people who who form who start a business? They would love they would love the people working working with them to you know to think like owners of the business and to act like owners of the business as well. But how do they handle that that that, that little bit of dissonance where they are not actually owners of the business? <laughs> <laughs> how, 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 how would you? How would you? So I guess in, in two sides, right? How would you? Because there may be people listening who are still employees, right? How would yes. how would you as an employee, how do you as an employee sort of take in that and manage <laughs> manage your manage how you how you treat with the business? And how do you as an owner on the on the other side try to manage that little bit of a little bit of dissonance? <laughs> well, I mean, what I would say is be specific, right? Because the way I run my business may be different from the way that you run your business. So, you know, a, a blanket statement, like think like an owner, I understand the intent behind it and it's really good intent, but recognize that by doing that, you're giving them the, um, the, the latitude to respond in a way that you may not be comfortable with, right? So recognize what you're giving them the, 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 the license to do, because as an owner, <clears throat> I may make some concessions um, to, I don't know if it's win new clients or if it's a customer service um, issue that you may not be comfortable with. So in many cases like that, it, it helps to, yes, say, think like an owner, but then take it a step, a, a, a step deeper by saying, and this is what that means, right? So this is what that means in this area. And this is what that means in that area. So you're still putting that boundary there mm -hmm. so that there can be, you can still have some elements of, as I mentioned, responsibility, accountability, right? You're responsible, but this is what it looks like, right? And yes, you have some latitude, but many owners are, tend to also have a very strict vision for their business. So ensuring that the employees are following through on that business, on, on your vision, it, sometimes it helps to, to put some, some blinders and some, um, some barriers so that they know where they're, um, hmm. how far they can move. And, and I guess on, on the on the employee side, where you know where their their boss is saying, "Hey, think like an owner." Yes. <laughs> how, do Some, they, how do they manage that? 
<laughs> well, you know, in, in many cases, they say you have to hire for the attitude, right? Because right. indeed, indeed, sometimes you may have someone with the technical skills, but they may not have that attitude and, and to, to really follow through. So just like you said, you may say, you know, they may be shouting the battle cry. Yes, yes, I will think like an owner, but on the inside, they may be thinking, yeah, but you don't pay me to be an owner. <laughs> right? Uh, am I right? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, so I, there, I know. I there mean, may be elements. I, I, assume, I assume people would think so. Yeah. There may be elements of that. Um, so, you know, as, as an employee, know what you're stepping into right? If this is a role that you're really passionate about and you can see yourself growing and you can see yourself improving and, and, and getting to where you need to go, get to, you know, put in, you know, put in that effort. And even if it's not, you know, someone is, is really hiring you to, to deliver on something. So always, always do your best, you know, regardless of what the situation might be. Yes, there may be some rumblings, there may be some dissonance, but this is the opportunity for you to have those conversations, not with your colleagues at the water cooler, but with the people who can actually do something about it, right? So if you have gripes, for example, by saying, yes, think like an owner, but, but I have a life, so I'm not here to run this business 24-7. Well, have you had that conversation around boundaries, right? Another boundary conversation with your employer to say, yeah, man, I understand that sometimes it's a crunch time, but you know, I, I'm also managing my family, family dynamic, et cetera, and so forth. Right. So it's about having that conversation, because the last thing that you want is any negative feelings to really permeate the, the work environment. That's never a good thing. Right. Yeah. And I mean, I guess another I guess another interpretation of how you could look at it is, you know, well, so there's the ownership of your outcomes, like, like what you just described. Right. Ownership of yeah. whatever it is you are in charge of. And I mean, if you want to and if you want to go a little deeper and think of yourself as a entrepreneur versus entrepreneur because you're in a company you know you could even think of yourself as a contractor for the, that that this company has hired to carry out certain tasks but then even then there's there might be still be that little bit of dissonance uh, you know as a uh, that goes beyond what's on what's on your job description or or what have you what is expected from your from your roles technically to the softer side of thinking like an owner of that business rather than just your own business. So, yeah. But then also it comes down to the environment, you know, the environment that's created by the owners and, and, and by the power, powers that be, as they say. So when you see an employee going the extra mile, what do you do to recognize them for that? You know, how do you, you know, give them the, the, that pat on the back that they need to continue doing what they do, right? Rewarding the behaviors that you would like to see continued or that you would like to have continued in the business. Yeah. Right. So sometimes it's about creating this environment where certain ownership type behaviors are recognized and they're amplified in a way for for everyone to see. Right. Sometimes that goes a long way um, to, to helping further that cause. You know, you know that's you bring you bring up an interesting point is because I, I feel like and I'm not I'm not a psychologist or anything like that, but it, it, it always feels like human criticism has a bias to the negative, mm. you know? So an, an employee might be doing great things and, and you might be like, okay, well, that's, that's what they're supposed to do. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Cool. All right. I see you, but thanks. But you missed something. You know, there's a lot more energy. There might be a lot more energy spent on reprimanding that employee or, 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 or whatnot and even just in our own human human relationship it's not just an employee relationship but but yeah it might a lot more energy might be focused on reprimanding on the negative you know so is would you recommend somebody would you recommend a business owner like going going hard on the positive so they do something good and it could be something small like hey you got that you got those numbers in the spreadsheet to make sense great job like hey that's awesome <laughs> <You know? laughs> as opposed to hey um, something wrong with the spreadsheet what the hell did you do are you incompetent oh, no no now we're gonna lose money now we look we look silly you know so how do you <laughs> how do you yeah how do you balance that that sort of feedback that's always tilted it's sort of as sort of as a negative bias you know as opposed to when things go well Listen to me, don't give empty praise, right? Authenticity is, is the number one thing when it comes to, to giving praise, right? Is what I would say, but recognize your personality. If you're not the type of person who gives, you know, and it doesn't need to be the level of giving high fives, 
But you, if you're the type, if you're not the type of person who is comfortable, you know, giving people that positive motive, because not everybody is, right? And not every, therefore not everyone can do it um, positively. Ensure that you know where your weaknesses are as well, right? So perhaps you have someone else, you know, if, if it's an interim manager, recognize them. And, you know, maybe at the end of the month, you can, if, if there's a, a team meeting or something, then recognize that person in your own way or recognize their efforts in your own way. But you certainly don't want to be walking around the office in an inauthentic way because that is just annoying and it does the complete opposite <laughs> of what you're trying to achieve. You know, people can see through that. So recognize them in a way that's authentic to you, but also in a way that forwards and advances what you're trying to achieve in the business. So if there's certain behaviors that you think, you know, okay, this, this is the direction that I want things to be going in, it is up to you to take stock of that and then take a step back and say, okay, and this is how I, because I would like others to also see that, this is how I will recognize X or Y or Z person, you know, if, if I see these sorts of behavior, behaviors exhibited. But do it in, in as authentic a way as possible and get help if you need it. Fantastic. All right, Rochelle. As we get ready to wrap, I just want to give you the floor. Is there anything that we did not cover today that you want to make sure and get out to our audience? You have open mic, open forum, open platform, all at you. <laughs> no, I mean, the main thing that I would say is, listen, you're working very, very hard to build your business. So whatever your plans are, ensure that your business is protected, right? Put that business continuity plan in place. Yes, of course, you can hire a business continuity advisor, but we also have an online platform where you can go in and create your own business continuity plan yourself. So just ensure that your, your growth is protected so that you're not... Um, taking the funds away from the reallocating the funds or diverting the funds from the growth of your business to deal to dealing with um with disruptions that's the first thing and what can i say planning and preparation really are the cornerstones of the long-term survival of your business so ensure that you're spending some time to think not only of the immediate needs of the business but on how you intend to carry this business forward in the long term podcast world there you have it succession strength with rochelle clark rochelle where can we find your business <laughs> uh, so yes of course you can find me at successionstrength.com um and yeah pop onto the website and of course reach out the the the, the business continuity platform is on continuitystrength.com and i think that's it subscribe to caribbean power lunch at caribbeanpowerlunch.com slash subscribe check us out on Castbox, spotify google Podcasts. Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you listen to your podcast. And with that, Podcast World, Rochelle. <laughs> Kevin, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, it is fantastic. It's very young. It is very, very insightful. All right. With that, Podcast World, we are out. <laughs>